Hello, my name is Dr. Henry Rodriguez, and I'm the director of the National Cancer Institute's Office of Cancer Clinical Proteomics Research. I think the beauty of proteogenomics is that it offers the ability to provide a more comprehensive picture of the underlying biology of cancer. And I think that that was already unequivocally demonstrated by the National Cancer Institute's CPTAC program, where they actually demonstrated the ability when you combine proteomics comprehensively above a comprehensive layer of genomics, both in colorectal cancer, breast cancer, and ovarian cancer, you're able to pull out additional biology that is either difficult to obtain or simply not feasible through a one omics-based approach. So for me, it is the convergence of these, dip, uh, of these disciplines that begins to shed new light on our ability to not only understand the biology, but hopefully we could translate the biology towards better patient care. I'd say from a short-term perspective, the main one is to take the genomics information and to better connect it to a functional environment. From a long-term perspective, is that you want to take not just the data, but the knowledge you're able to extrapolate from the data and potentially take that biology, the additional biology is going to be more comprehensive and again, potentially move it towards better patient care. The reality is, I believe that a proteogenomics perspective provides a more systems perspective of the biology itself. And what we'd like to do is potentially use that additional fundamental knowledge to better identify what type of treatments to provide our patients, and also at the same time try to understand how they would be responding to not only existing therapies, but potentially next generation based therapies. Actually, what I kind of see more is as technologies are maturing and our ability to measure more things not only at a tissue level, but even at a cellular level, I'm firmly a believer that you're gonna see more and more a convergence of different disciplines. You can look at genomics converging with the proteomics, the proteomics converging along with the genomics and the imaging you throw into the mix, and even metabolites. So for me, it's the blending of these disciplines that you're gonna see more and more over the, let's say, the horizon of a 10-year window. But more importantly, is that the information that's being developed, the data, the big data, as a lot of people refer to it, I think that's gonna be a key area that's gonna be very promising in the years to come. For me, quite frankly, I actually see data as the new oil and our ability to be able to not only look at the information, but the ones that's gonna be able to actually apply a lot of artificial intelligence, deep learning, and extrapolate the knowledge, I think that's where you're gonna see a lot of fundamental breakthroughs when it comes to precision oncology. Absolutely. So ICPC, the beauty of that, I think that's one of the initiatives that was inspired by the United States Cancer Moonshot effort. Today, it's an incredible program. Currently, it involves 12 countries. That spans over 31 institutions. Collectively, all these institutions in these countries are now working together to try to better understand over a dozen cancer types at the molecular level. I think the part that also makes it extra special is that each one of these institutions in these countries have pledged of the molecular data that they generate, they're gonna make it available to the public. So for me, the idea of ICPC, the goal, the ultimate goal is actually quite simple. And that is ultimately to develop an international database that's now is gonna be representative of the diversity of people along with their cancers around the world and making that accessible to the rest of the population across the globe. You know, for me, the idea of putting data in the public domain actually stems from three fundamental principles behind it. One, I think a lot of the information, quite frankly, is gonna be pretty competitive. But the part that's quite nice about it is that by putting it out in the public domain, it allows other individuals to look at the data sets and hopefully it stimulates new hypotheses along the same cancer that most likely wasn't hypothesized prior. So it stimulates new research at a fundamental level. Secondly, I think by other people getting access to data, it further stimulates the development of new computational tools. 
And we hope that those computational tools are able to identify new discoveries within those original data sets. And quite frankly, what I've noticed is by putting this data in the public domain, you actually bring in new people into the research and you make it a much more multidisciplinary than it prior would have existed in the years past. And by bringing in new individuals, making it multidisciplinary, bringing computational sound, uh, sciences along with the people that produce the data, I hope you could take the fundamental biology and extrapolate the new knowledge that hopefully will be translated towards cancer care. So one of the lessons that I've now learned over the past just over 10 years of having the privilege and the honor to kind of lead the National Cancer Institute's Clinical Proteomic Tumor Analysis Consortium is that the fundamental belief and truly now the knowledge that by having multidisciplinary research groups in the space of oncology actually accelerate science. The other component that really inspired me was to call for the US-based cancer moonshot and its overarching objectives, which are very simplistic. One, accelerate cancer research. For me, a lot of that involves in developing these team-based programs. But the other two, which were very key in the cancer moonshot, was one and first and foremost, is greater cooperation and collaboration amongst researchers, not just within one institution, within a country, but across countries. And secondly, is making the information available to the public. And that is something I've been very passionate about. We've been doing for over 10 years now. In fact, 15, if you look at genomics landscape of what NCI has done within TCGA, now CPTAC, and now expanding that to other people across the globe. So for me, the Cancer Moonshot, what it represents is hope. Hope that's gonna be offered, not just for the research community, but also towards patients and their loved members that are inflicted with cancer. You know, one of the things that has always driven me in life is the ability and the willingness to take a risk. And I know that NCI, when they actually asked me years ago to actually join, one of the things that I've admired about the NCI is that it is an organization that enjoys taking risk. And what, I'm, and what I mean by that are two initiatives that are very dear to me and stand out. The very first one is the Cancer Genome Atlas. That was a big risk for the NCI. We did not know what would come out of it, but we always had this feeling that by looking at a tumor, looking at cancer at the molecular level, that we would begin to better understand and unravel the mysteries of nature when it comes to that disease. And at the same time, we took the same risk when it came to proteomics, specifically with the CPTAC program. So for me, one of the driving factors is the willingness to take risk along the same lines now. I think that we've taken with the Cancer Moonshot, both in the Apollo and ICPC. It's that fundamental belief that if we just take that little risk, go and explore an area of science, that we think that there's a glimmer of hope. The belief is that taking the risk, you'll have rewards. And the rewards ultimately for us is to translate it towards better patient care. So, the simple answer is absolutely. The reality is technology is technically ambivalent to the biology that you're trying to go after. So if at the fundamental core, what you're trying to find out is, can I identify very key molecular signatures that could better help me understand the disease as a whole than both genomics, proteomics, and even the convergence of those two from a proteogenomic perspective will absolutely be beneficial. Furthermore, you could also look at these different technologies and the disciplines and potentially then begin to develop diagnostic techniques to be able to detect such infectious diseases and not really within a city but even in remote villages if that's something that's going to be even more important. So I fundamentally do believe and I think a good understanding is technology is really not specific towards a disease. That's the beauty. When you, de when you develop technology from one discipline, it could easily be applicable to, an, uh, to another discipline. So I am D.R. Mani. I'm a principal computational scientist uh, at the Broad Institute of uh, uh, Harvard and MIT. 
Um, I'm in the proteomics platform there and my primary role is to apply statistics and machine learning methods to the analysis of all kinds of uh, proteomics data. So we look at discovery proteomics, targeted proteomics, proteogenomics. We apply computational methods and algorithms to the analysis of all kinds of uh, proteomics data with the hope of achieving a, a rigorous approach to um, analyzing uh, data so that uh, whatever comes out is, uh, is defensible. So the main uh, reason for using uh, labeled um, uh, com proteomics methods is to make sure that you can achieve higher throughput than is currently possible in proteomics. So right now, genomics can do really high throughput. You can sequence genomes very fast. But in order to do proteomics and uh, get a proteomic profile for a sample, it takes quite a while. And so it helps to be able to uh, multiplex samples so that you can uh, hopefully increase throughput by fivefold or tenfold in many situations. In order to do that in a large study, you really need to be able to uh, run many of these um, uh, multiplexed experiments and then be able to connect them together. So if you have hundreds of samples in a relatively large study, you, you would need many different uh, experiments to accommodate all those if you are doing multiplexing uh, five or 10 uh, samples in each experiment. And when you do that, um, you have to have some kind of a way to link all the data together so that you can put all your samples together and then uh, do a statistical analysis. And so in order to do that, the primary uh, a tool that we use is uh, what we call the reference sample. And in most situations, this is created by combining a pool of uh, different samples in your uh, project. Uh, but it's done in such a way that you either use all your samples, or if you're using a subset, you uh, sample the subset to represent the, the groups in your original uh, uh, project so that there is no bias in terms of what went into the reference pool. But once you have that, you kind of create a, a, a large vat of a sample that you can put on every one of your um, multiplex experiments so that at the end of the project, you can use that pool to uh, weed out variation from experiment to experiment in, in some way normalize on a experiment by experiment basis uh, so that you get data that now you can compare across um, different experiments so that all your samples can be uh, put together into one table and then you can perform your statistical or machine learning analysis. So in proteomics, um, missing values are a bigger issue because um, the proteomics methodology of how you obtain a proteomic profile. So you inject a sample into the mass spectrometer and then you do what is called data dependent analysis. Or e even if you don't do that but use other methods, there is no reliable way of um, uh, obtaining a, a measurement of every protein in your sample. Um, with genes, for, for, for example, in genomics, if you're doing uh, RNA profiling, it's more easy to get a catalog of all the transcripts you would like to see and then put them on a chip or even if you're doing RNA sequencing without a, a, a microarray or a chip, you can still kind of see uh, almost all the genes that are expected to be uh, present. But with proteomics, the issue is that it's a very stochastic, the measurement is a very stochastic process and so you end up uh, not measuring many of the proteins that are present in your sample. So in most situations in proteomics, if something is not measured, it does not mean it wasn't there. It could also be because it was there, but you weren't able to see it with your measurement methodology. That is less of a problem with uh, uh, genomics. And so missing values have to be treated more carefully in proteomics. And if you go to looking, uh, if you start looking at um, post-translational modifications like phosphorylation or acetylation, then the problem is even more compounded because a phosphocyte that might be phosphorylated in one sample may not be phosphorylated in another sample. And when you're measuring these phosphopeptides, 
those pep phosphopeptides may not be seen in many other samples. And so the uh, missing value problem is much more compounded. And so anal analysis of proteomics data now requires uh, more careful thought on what to do with missing values. There are many ways to approach the problem, but I think the bottom line is that when you are analyzing proteomics data, you have to be constantly cognizant of the fact that there are missing values, the fact that these missing values are related to abundance. So in other words, the values are missing because the abundance is most likely low. And in those situations, um, statistically, you have to be very careful how you deal with missing values. And in many cases, you might want to use tools that can either systematically handle missing values, or if you're going to remove missing values, it has to be done in a very uh, careful and thoughtful manner. So when we are talking of uh, proteomics or genomics or proteogenomics, um, we are talking of experiments where a large number of things are measured. So in genomics, you could measure like 15, 18, or 20,000 genes. In proteomics, you measure 10 to 15,000 proteins. Or if you're looking at phosphocytes, in a study, you might have 25, 40, or 50,000 phosphocytes you have measured. And when you're trying to use this data to find what is differentially expressed in uh, groups of interest for your study, like cancer versus normal or different cancer subtypes. You do what are called marker selection or marker uh, analysis, where you try to find markers that are upregulated or downregulated in subgroups or uh, uh, of the sample set that you're looking at. And when you do that, you apply standard statistical tests like t-test or f-test or um, um, uh, rank tests and uh, many uh, different tests. And the problem with these tests is that if you repeatedly apply them on a large number of uh, features, in this case genes or proteins, you can end up with things that appear to be statistically significantly differential in your groups just by random chance. And so the more tests you do, the more likely it is that something might appear to be uh, statistically different between your groups while it's not really the uh, case in reality. And so to account for this and to have results that are more robust and kind of more believable from a biological perspective, you would want to apply what is called multiple testing correction. So here the statistical significance that is assigned to a test is uh, adjusted because you are doing many, many tests, like thousands or tens of thousands of tests. So um, when, once you take that into account, your statistical significance is reasonably adjusted, and then you can get results that are um, more believable with fewer false positives. Uh, even after that, you still have to be careful to make sure that you are cognizant that there could be false positives or um, other false discoveries in your data, but um, using multiple testing correction is the first step to kind of getting results that are uh, more robust and are, are worth following up from a biological perspective. So um, most uh, studies, whether it's proteomic or genomic, start off by doing normalization, where you are trying to put all the samples on an equal footing so that you can compare across samples and analyze them and any minor differences in how the sample was prepared or how much was loaded on the mass spectrometer are kind of uh, subtracted out so that what is left is mostly the biological differences between the samples. And one way of doing that kind of normalization is called quantile normalization, where the quantiles of the uh, observed values of the proteins or peptides are kind of made uh, the same. Uh, in other words, the distributions are are, are morphed to kind of make all of them similar. So when you do that, things that are extreme, in other words, so you were doing a cancer normal comparison and there was a protein that was very highly regulated in cancer, but, not, uh, but the proteins that are regulated in a normal sample don't have that uh, extreme uh, values that they have achieved. When you do quantile normalization, then it kind of squashes the signal in the, in the cancer uh, or the uh, extreme uh, subset of samples, uh, kind of pulling them together towards the, kind of pulling them towards the, the mean. And what that does is you are 
uh, ideal biomarker signal will now be either not strong or could actually get obliterated because of the way you did your normalization. And so in general, quantile normalization is, is not an um, uh, approach to use on, on an average project. In, in other words, it's not the standard approach one would consider using. And if it is used, it has to be used very carefully and you would need to think about why you want to use it and if it makes sense. So I think the way computer science has evolved in the last few years, um, artificial intelligence and machine learning and uh, all those areas, the, the buzzwords that you hear are becoming actually more and more useful in doing analysis and kind of making sense of large amounts of data in a large number of fields. Um, uh, so they started in computer science, but now they are almost universally percolating to all other areas. And I think in biology, as we go into the era of omics with genomics and proteomics and proteogenomic data, we are going to collect more and more data. And the biologist who has the domain knowledge of the kind of things they are looking for in their uh, studies will need, to be ha will need to have some knowledge of the kind of tools that can be used and uh, how to correctly apply them. So I think the biologist of the future will need to have uh, a more significant understanding of what computational tools are available, when they are applicable, and to some degree also be able to apply them, uh, at least for simple uh, everyday settings where they are generating data, they should be able to analyze their data without having to wait for a, a computational or a bioinformatics scientist to, uh, scientist to come and uh, look at their data. So on a day-to-day -day basis, I think the future biologists should be comfortable doing their own data analysis. And it, when, when it comes to special or one-off analyses or analyses with more complex study designs, then uh, they, they definitely should collaborate with the computational scientist, but they should also be in a state where they can understand what the computational scientist is doing, be able to speak their language, and to um, be able to understand whether the techniques applied are appropriate or not. And to some degree, it also applies in the other direction. Computational scientists should also know enough biology to have a common language with, uh, so they can carry on an intelligent conversation with biologists. And strong uh, collaborations with uh, people who have deep roots in computation and deep roots in biology, I think is the future of, of good research. And so both teams should be able to converse with each other and be able to understand each other's fields a little more than is currently done, I think.